Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be presenting uh, a go-kart steering mechanism. This is actually off of a go-kart that I made myself uh, over the past few summers uh, for the class design of mechanisms uh, at Rutgers University. And I hope you enjoy. So let's get into it. The parts of the steering mechanism, for my go-kart at least, uh, include a pitman arm, which ties into the steering column so you turn the steering column and it moves the pitman arm which pushes the tie rods that you see there and then in turn that turns the spindles which move the wheels and allow you to steer the go-kart uh, this is a fairly basic design that many go-karts use um, there's also another design um, the rack and pinion setup where you have a little rack and a pinion gear and you have a steering column which usually has two u-joints so you can adjust the output shaft with the pinion gear so that it's horizontal or level with the ground so that you can move that rack laterally without having to worry about um, the rack being turned a little bit or tilted forward and that will complicate how you steer um, but this is based off of a just a, a spindle tie rod and pitman arm setup if you will and so like I explained before you turn that steering column with the steering wheel which turns that pitman arm pushes the tie rod and then kicks out that spindle and from the driver's perspective, this is important. When you turn the steering wheel clockwise, the spindles also need to turn clockwise. And if you notice uh, on some other go-kart designs, they have the spindle arm, that's a little part that connects to the tie rods. It is behind the front of the go-kart, if that makes sense. And that's the reason for that is because the tie rods connect to the pitman arm but the pitman arm is pointing down towards the ground in some go-kart designs the pitman arm is directed up away from the ground and it's 180 degrees opposite on the steering column and when you do that the rotation of the pitman arm pushes those tie rods in the opposite direction basically so if you want to turn clockwise it will turn counterclockwise so to, to counteract that you would put the spindle arms facing forward and so basically you just reverse the two spindles on the go-kart you just swap them out for each other put the tie rods so that they are connected to the spindle arms facing forward and then you can steer um, as you as you you know then your steering output would match your input uh, and so when you look at the degree of freedoms the mobility of this mechanism this is a 3d mechanism so you're not looking at a planar mechanism that only um, moves with, with links that are planar these um, joints and links are in complex positions so they're moving uh, in 3d space uh, which means that each link will start out with six degrees of freedom right you can translate along the three axes you can move in the x direction in the y direction in the z direction and you can also rotate along any of those axes so that's six degrees of freedom so that's why uh, this is based off Grubler's equation. M equals 6 times the quantity L minus 1. And that 1 represents uh, all of your ground links. You just count them as 1. Because when you ground a link, you remove all of its degrees of freedom. But you can count all of your ground links as one link. So you would take the number of links, including the ground links, and just subtract 1. Because um, we're trying to find mobility with Grubler's equation. And with that, you would take all the degrees of freedom that you have available to you and you subtract all the degrees of freedom that are taken away from you 
when you have joints and connections. And so that first uh, joint parameter, J1, if you look at the little note I put in here, the joints are labeled J sub N, where N equals 6, which is the uh, maximum amount of degrees of freedom of each link. It's 6 minus the degrees of freedom removed. So for a J1 joint, that link connected to that joint would only have one degree of freedom because it would have five removed. And so that's why you have minus five J1. It removes five degrees of freedom for each joint J1 that you have. And that's the same thing for J2 and J4. For J2, you would remove four degrees of freedom for every J2 joint. And for every J4 joint, you would remove two degrees of freedom because that link would have four degrees of freedom left. Um, and I derived this myself. I had to scratch my head and think a little bit about it because it's not as simple as, as uh, planar mechanisms. Um, and there are other joint cases too, but I only included in the equation what applies to this uh, setup as it is. There are no J3s um, in this setup. There are no joints that take away three degrees of freedom and leave three degrees of freedom here. So I only included what uh, the setup already has. And so when you look at the steering setup and all the parts, there are five links. You have the two spindle arms, two tie rods, and one pitman arm. That makes five links. The J1, there are only two J1 joints because there are only two joints that give you only one degree of freedom, right? And those would be the spindles, those spindle joints are, you could call them full joints. When you're talking about uh, planar models, full joints um, take away two degrees of freedom and leave you with one. And for planar models, you, you have three degrees of freedom to start out with because you're just moving in planar space. So you can translate in two directions and rotate. Um, so th the only two joints that can count as J1 joints are the two spindle connection joints, right? Because they can only move, they can only rotate like this. So they only have one degree of freedom each. The J2s, there's only one J2 joint, uh, right? And that would be the Pitman arm because the Pitman arm, it's, it's in a wacky position it's offset at an angle. If you look at the steering column, it's offset at an angle. And so that means it's rotating in 3D space. So it's not just moving laterally and horizontally or laterally and vertically. It's moving in an, in an arc that's tilted off from the axis. So when you think about it, that Pitman arm takes away four degrees of freedom, that rotation, that joint that it has, takes away four degrees of freedom, right? It can't move, it can't translate that Pitman arm, but it can rotate. And if you think about it in terms of the combined uh, axes that it can rotate in, it, it will have two degrees of freedom because it can rotate, um, it has a combined rotation along like the z-axis and the x-axis. So it's not exactly straight up and down. It's not exactly flat. It's tilted. So it moves along two axes. And that's why we count it as a J2 joint. The J4 joints, these are tricky as well. They would be the heim joints or the ball joints at the ends of the tie rods. So each tie rod would have two ball joints at the ends. And this this is so that the steering linkages don't bind up when you're moving things because when well, you'll see later, the linkages don't just move, you know, laterally. They move vertically as well. And to make things uh, work nicely with each other, you put ball joints on the ends of the tie rods and that allows them to rotate in different directions and allows them to freely push the spindle arms out. 
And so that's why they're J4 joints, because they only remove two degrees of freedom, right? If you think about it, if you take that tie rod and you look at the ball joint at the end, and you think about turning that tie rod while holding the ball joint, you can move the tie rod up and down, so that's one degree of freedom. You can move it side to side, it's another. You can rotate it in place to an extent, which is another degree of freedom, that's three. But it's also connected to that Pitman arm, which is at a wacky angle. So that means that in all these motions, they're actually combined, they're actually moving in a combined you know, axis. So that means that it's actually moving with four degrees of freedom, right? It's not just moving laterally and vertically, it's moving sort of along two axes when you try to push it one way and two axes another way. And that additional axis that's combined with the rest gives it four degrees of freedom. It's a little tricky for me to explain, so I don't think I'm totally explaining this correctly or as efficiently as I could, but I hope uh, the following videos after this slide will clear things up a bit and you can visually see what I'm talking about. Okay, um, so when you plug in all these values, right, for the mobility, you would have 24 minus 22. You would start with 24 degrees of freedom and take out 22. You're left with 2 degrees of freedom. And this makes sense because if you think about it, the spindles are going to move and rotate like this. So that's like 1 degree of freedom. And then all the other miscellaneous movements are basically just horizontal and vertical movements. So that's like 2 degrees of freedom. And so this makes sense. And when you look at these videos of the motion, right? That Pitman arm is moving along two axes. Those tie rods are basically moving along two axes. The spindles are not. They're moving, they're just rotating like that. But in all, the mechanism has two degrees of freedom. And this is a good image as well. You can see from the top view how the tie rods are sort of not moving you know, along one axis, they're moving in and out a little bit, sort of like a rocking motion. And this view helps as well. You can actually see where I had to cut out parts of the floorboard supports to accommodate for the horizontal, uh, I'm sorry, the vertical displacement of those tie rods. And you can actually see as well the ball joints at the ends of the tie rods and how they're so important for allowing this motion and allowing for the steering to be smooth and responsive. All right, and so that's it. Uh, I hope this was, you know, sort of informative, and I hope you enjoyed the video.